Putting this all together, we assume that y was a function of theta and phi. So we solve for capital theta, and we've solved for capital phi. So now we just multiply those two solutions together, and we get our full final answer, which is the square root of 2l plus 1 times l minus the, the absolute value of m factorial divided by 4 pi times l plus the absolute value of m factorial times the Lissandre polynomial defined by m and l as a function of cosine theta times e to the i m phi. Here is a list of solutions for the rigid rotator. We can see that they look very similar to the associated Legendre solutions, only now they have the 1 over square root of 2 pi times e to the i m phi term multiplied with it. These solutions are a little more complicated than the solutions of the particle in a box or the simple harmonic oscillator because they have two numbers that fully define them, m being the top number and l being the bottom number. Notice that now that there is no absolute value operation happening to the m term. That's because the sine of m matters to the e to the i m phi component, so we must maintain the sine. However, it still has no effect on the theta component, which is the associated Legendre function part of the solution. Let's now look at the energy of these states. We can find a general expression for the energy, similar to how the energy of the particle in a box problem was found. Recall that we set 2i e over h bar squared to be equal to beta. And then also, in order to solve the differential equation related to theta, we had to set beta to be equal to l times l plus 1. If we were to arrange the, rearrange this expression and solve for the energy, we would get h bar squared over 2i times l l plus 1. This means that we can write a general expression for the Schrodinger equation as the Hamiltonian times the wave function y, and that's equal to h bar squared l l plus 1 divided by 2i times the wave function y. Also recall that the solutions to the associated Legendre functions are only valid if l is equal to 0 or any positive integer. Therefore, the energy is quantized due to the solution of the differential equation. So let's take this energy and let's use it to solve some spectroscopy-related examples. Now remember, what we're talking about here is, again, we have a diatomic molecule that's going to be rotating. And there's some distance r that represents the distance or the interatomic distance between the two atom centers. And so what we're doing is we're trying to find the frequency of the photon that would kick it from some state L into some higher energy state where it's going to be moving much faster. And basically it's just the state that's one energy level higher than it, L plus one. And so to do that, we would then just start off by saying delta E, well that's equal to the energy of the L plus one state minus the energy of the L state. The delta E, well that's equal to the energy of the photon that's coming in, so that's H times nu. The energy of the L plus one state is H bar squared over two times I and that's equal to L plus 1 times L plus 1 plus 1, being the L plus first state. And from that, I'm going to be taking off h bar squared over 2 times i, L, L plus 1. So my next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the h bar squares into h squares over 4 pi's. Here I've got h nu, and that's equal to h squared over 4 pi squared times 2 times i. Here I've got l plus 1, and I've got l plus 1 plus 1, so that's l plus 2. From that I'm going to subtract off h squared over 4 pi squared times 2 times i. And I still have an l, l plus 1. So in this case now I can cross off the h on the left hand side and these squared terms. And so now I'm just left with the frequency is equal to, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, substitute out, or not sorry, not substitute, but distribute out common terms. So I'm going to have h divided by, since I have an h in both of these terms on the right hand side, I have a 4 pi squared 2 times i, and I have an l plus 1. So these are all the terms that will come out front. The 4 times pi squared times 2, well that gives me 8 pi squared times i, and I have an l plus 1 term. 
what I'm left with is L plus 2 minus L. So in this case now I've got an L minus L so they cancel out and so I'm just left with a 2. This 2 is going to be divided by the 8 so my final answer is going to be H 4 pi squared times I L plus 1. So what we have here is a generalized expression which describes the frequency of the photon required to excite a rigid rotator from any state into the next elevated state. Now what if we wanted to write it in terms of wave numbers? Well, we know that the speed of light c is equal to lambda times nu, which means nu is equal to c over lambda. So I'm going to take this term and I'm going to start writing up over here on the right hand side. So the nu I can write as c over lambda, and that's equal to this h over 4 pi squared i l plus 1. I'm going to move the c to the other side, so I have 1 over lambda, and that's equal to h over 4 pi squared i times c, and that's multiply l plus 1. In this case, I'm going to substitute in some common language for rotational spectroscopy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let b tilde, I'm going to let that be equal to h divided by 8 pi squared i times c. And so what that means for my wave number expression, this 1 over lambda expression, is that 1 over lambda is equal to 2 times b tilde times l plus 1. And so what this means, or what this tells us, is that any time that we have a transition, then the distance in wave number, or in energy, which is basically what we're calculating when we calculate a wave number or frequency, we can almost think of it as the energy of the photon. What it means is that it's going to have equally spaced lines that are going to be two times b tilde apart. Let's see this in practice. So we have our transition that goes from the zero to the first energy level, well the wave number of the photon that is involved in this transition, well that would be equal to the photon that's related to 2 b tilde 0 plus 1, because whenever we substitute in this expression the L is the L of the original state that we're in. So that means my 1 over lambda is equal to 2 times b tilde. If I look at the transition from the first to the second energy level, then the wave number in that case is equal to 2 times b tilde 1 plus 1, which means that my 1 over lambda is equal to 4 b tilde. And so the difference in these wave numbers, well, that's just 4 b tilde minus 2 b tilde, which means that it's equal to 2 b tilde. And this is true for any transitions or any adjacent transitions. So if I had written down 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, I would still get a difference in wave number that's equal to 2 times b tilde. The figure on the left shows a general energy level diagram for purely rotational transitions. We can see the increase in the change in energy as the L value increases. However, the change in wave number denoted with a nu with a tilde over are equally spaced with the difference of 2b tilde between each spectral line. Let's now look at the second question, which says, to a good approximation, the microwave spectrum of HCl consists of a series of equally spaced lines separated by 6.26 times 10 to the 11 hertz. Calculate the bond length of HCl. Now, when it comes to rotational spectroscopy, one common feature to it is that it is very straightforward to calculate bond lengths of molecules. And so that is the process that we're doing for this example. In the problem, what it essentially implies or what it's saying is that we have, if this is my generalized spectrum where I have hertz right there, then I'm going to have a set of equally spaced lines where the distance between each of these lines is 6.62 or sorry, 6.626 times 10 to the 11 hertz. But the one thing that we can keep in mind is that this original transition, so the one from the 0 to 1 energy levels, that's also going to be 6.26 
times 10 to the 11 hertz. So we can write this problem, or we can approach this problem by just looking at what is the wavelength, or sorry, what is the frequency for that transition where we're transitioning from 0 to 1, which is something that we've already done explicitly in a previous problem. We know that for the frequency of any transition, we can write it as h over 4 pi squared i times l plus 1. And in this case, again, we're looking at the 0 to first transition to basically give us this distance, this 6.26 times 10 to the 11 hertz. So I'm going to just substitute in 0 for l. And so what I'm left with is 6.26 times 10 to the 11. That's equal to h over 4 pi squared i 0 plus 1, which means that I get this term on the right to just be equal to 1. Now if I keep writing this out, what I'm going to do is I'm trying to solve for r, and r is hidden in my moment of inertia. 6.26 times 10 to the 11 is equal to h over 4 pi squared mu r squared. And so if I rearrange and I move my r to the other side, then I'm going to get r is equal to 4 pi squared mu times 6.26 times 10 to the 11. h divided by that all to the square root. So the only thing that I still need to calculate at this point is just what is my reduced mass mu. So mu in this case, well that's going to be equal to 35 times the mass unit times 1 times the mass unit. And that's going to be divided by 35 times the mass unit plus the 1 times the mass unit. And this then reflects the isotope of chlorine and the isotope of hydrogen being 35 and 1. And so if I substitute in numbers, then what I'm going to get is 35 times 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. And then I'm going to be dividing by, I'm sorry, that should have been squared. And I get 36 times 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. Now in this case, the atomic mass unit cancels out on the bottom with the squared sign. And I end up with a mu of 1.615 times 10 to the minus 27. And that would be in kilograms. That means then I can continue calculating the radius of this molecule. R is going to be equal to, now I can sub in numbers, 4 pi squared, 1.615 times 10 to the minus 27. I'll fix my answer up here. Times 6.26 times 10 to the 11 hertz. I have my h on top, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, and all of this is under a square root. And so in the end, my r is going to be equal to 1.29 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 129, or sorry, 1.29 angstroms. The accepted value for this is roughly about 127 or 1.27 angstroms. So we can see that just looking at or using a, a very simplified model of the system being using a rigid rotator approximation and we know already that this molecule is going to be vibrating so it's not actually rigid but just assuming that it is rigid and measuring what is the spectral lines from a rotational spectroscopy experiment we can get a very close idea as to what is the distance between the HCl, what is the bond distance of the HCl bond.